when the missionary had been mentioned, the Colombian brothers, uh, which had been one of my neighbors uh, when I lived in Ireland, in the countryside, uh, a cousin or something, uh, and I thought, right, there is another link uh, between my existence, basically, uh, and Ireland, and I didn't know, uh, and, and China, and I didn't know actually if I liked this, <clears throat> being part of this uh, identifying myself with my neighbor and with uh, this missionary work. Um, it is, I think, very complex, not least because we frequently forget to talk about very simple things. And this is, for instance, uh, identification with something. And of course, we have the different levels. Uh, we are identifying uh, ourselves as individuals, but as well, there is this question of uh, the state identity, the national identity, and then there is something in between and we cannot really figure it out because it is shifting. Uh, it is shifting according to certain circumstances uh, we are involved in and where it is actually difficult for us to identify ourselves if it does not come to extreme situations where we need actually this identification uh, as defense or as a positive thing, uh, and I think this is a very important uh, tension we have, as a positive thing, this is what we want to do. This is where we want to be part of something of a project which can, of course, be a national project, uh, but it can be a local project as well. So in a way, uh, in short, we have different identities. And in many cases, that's another simple thing we should not forget. We are, or part of our identity is something that we reject. Neoliberalism had been men mentioned. Uh, we are all in one way or another part of this project of neoliberalism. This is the world we live in, and we cannot easily uh, escape, if we can at all, and if we want, of course. But it's general, uh, in, in general, it's kind of a rejected concept. It's uh, privatization, it is putting us under pressure, and it is actually limiting uh, our capacity to, um, to act. The question of uh, the image of China can be in some respect uh, summarized in one uh, sentence I quote. It's, no, it's two sentences. Europeans have been trying to achieve such political union for the last 70 years, but it has remained an unfulfilled promise. This is the threat of China, and perhaps that's because the EU lacks the most basic ingredient uh, of a political unity, the fear of an external threat. So this is China, but at the same time, it is not really this threat uh, of, uh, of a European, uh, united Euro uh, Europe. So there is something uh, going on in terms of an economic development. Uh, the, you, you mentioned the term uh, developing country, uh, developing region. And I think this is what actually the European Union says in a recent paper. Uh, it is going beyond this stage. It is a developed country, and it is definitely what is not said in this board. Uh, it is definitely a threat for Europe. A threat for Europe in terms especially of the economy. There are different ways uh, or different estimates what it actually means, but in general it is said that China will overtake the Western and especially the European um, economies. I did a little bit uh, Chinese exercise. Uh, I don't know if I'm correct there. I mentioned it uh, already yesterday in another lecture. Uh, Huawei, uh, meaning the promise, China, the promise, uh, China, we can. So this is a new self-esteem then on the other side. 
uh, as one of the companies, one of the leading companies, saying in the name, uh, we can do it. What you did, we are able to do this as well. And what you did is uh, actually something we do not copy, but we go beyond this and we have something where we say this is actually a new kind of identity we are looking for and we are working for and uh, kept in the uh, 19th uh, Congress, uh, CPC National Congress in 2017. I just, uh, when I left China, I saw this in the paper. Um, discussed as main contradiction today the tension between unbalanced and inadequate uh, development and the people's ever-growing need for a better life. And this is something uh, I, I don't want to politicize this now and I don't want to go into the details of, of the discussion uh, of, of the party, but this is an orientation we find actually uh, there is something, it is not simply a growth strategy uh, on the international or on the global level, but there is something reconsidering that, they, uh, that, that China has gone beyond this, uh, what, what had been said before. In 1981, the party changed the, its assessment uh, of the principal contradictions to the ever-growing material and cultural needs of the people versus backward social production. So, kind of summary, we are reasonably well off now and now we have to look into quality issues. We have a reasonably uh, well-developed industrial uh, basis, but now we have to look for something else because it is actually not uh, anymore this industrial production. And I think this is why I mentioned uh, neoliberalism, and this is why where, where I did not mention my uh, interest in, in digital industries and uh, artificial intelligence, the developments here, where the old industrial capitalism uh, doesn't proceed anymore and where there is a move to something new and I say something new because China and the West Europe or the America doesn't know anymore what it will be. So Going back to nationalism, that's what we have, that's where we know we are, and building walls, uh, wherever we go, building national identities as a very strong focus uh, of what we are doing, of our interest, and actually failing because we are running into trouble. We are closing actually uh, the external markets, we are closing uh, delivery processes, uh, and we have problems then uh, with, with value chains and all this in economics. But as well, we have difficulties uh, in terms of constitutions, the legal side. If you go actually into law, uh, there are two very interesting things, I, uh, I suppose. The one is any law, including constitutions, have a very short time of validity. The original constitutions had been made for life, so to say. Our life is going to be extended, but the life of constitutions, of laws, is getting shorter and shorter. In many cases, you have actually the uh, consultation of a, uh, or, or the, the decision on a new law, and in the back rooms, they are already deciding on the changes. And at the same time, especially with constitutions, you have the constitution still as the basic law, that was the term actually in, in Germany when they didn't have a constitution as such, they have a basic law, and it is not a basic law anymore, it is not valid anymore, for two reasons. The one is, there is always a kind of ping-pong game between the political, political side, the politicians, the parliaments, and the constitutional courts, where nobody knows actually what new legislation is about. It has to be decided by the constitutional court, is it in line with the constitution? So the, the constitution as such is not clear, and it is not a point of identification that is agreed upon. So there is no basic consensus. We are always discussing, for good or bad reasons, uh, this, the, the meaning 
of what actually constitutions is about, uh, are about. The other point is uh, that actually the constitutional courts take over the role of policy making, and policy making as such uh, is not independent of the law anymore. Which means. And then you find actually linked to uh, uh, digital industries as well, uh, that it is more and more codified, binarized. It is, in computer language, zero on and one, and you mix something there. And in law, it is uh, against the law or in favor, uh, in, in line with the law. So there is no flexibility in terms of using uh, this instrument. Which is, I think, interesting when it comes then to the, what, what I mentioned, the, the recent paper from the European Commission, that they say China has to be obliged to keep to observe international rules. Which I think is very striking in terms of the relationship. Now, sit back and try to understand it, something that is not possible, we, we, we cannot understand, uh, in terms of the European Union. The European Union cannot be member of itself because it does not observe its own rules. So if the European Union as a body would apply for membership, the European Union would have to say, oh, sorry, it's not possible. You are not, uh, you are not observing the rules of the EU. Um, which means, that's easier to understand, if a member state with the same rules as the EU would apply, the European Union would say, no, sorry, that's not possible, you do not, uh, your, your, your action, your political action is not in line uh, with, with European rules. Now, this is on the international or global level now, of course, a problem. Who sets the rules if we don't have rules anymore? If we have rules set not by states, by constitutional states, but rules that are set by large enterprises, that are set by digital industries, that are set to some extent as well by professional bodies, and that are set especially by administrations. Niklas Luhmann had been talking about uh, the legitimation by, proce uh, by, proce by procedure. So everything is OK as long as you follow the rules that are set to be observed. Content doesn't play a role anymore. And this is, I think, uh, increasingly a problem uh, when it comes to international and global situation, uh, negotiations as well, that we have the problem uh, that content is not discussed anymore. What is happening is discussions, negotiations on a procedural level set by administrations. I worked a long time in connection with the uh, European institutions, European Union institutions, and there had been only very, on, on very few exceptions, uh, discussions on content. As soon as you entered a field that was contested, then there was this drawback, and people said, well, this is not we, something we have to discuss, but this is something the court has to decide or the administration. So you have an endless delay, and uh, you do not have a way out. The way out. I think is something where we need, and they are linked to, to, to the uh, over to the new Silk Road, is something where I think we have to rethink identity in terms of making explicit that we have different identities and trying to find formal processes as well, constitutional processes uh, that are if you want to uh, have uh, this, this term recontentualized, getting content again. What we find now is uh, 
you can have different uh, uh, terms for it. At least, well, the, the first two are clear. It's methodological individualism and methodological nationalism. This is always the focus. Whatever we do, whatever we think, is it is me and I am, I don't know what, I am German, Chinese, French, uh, Irish, or whatsoever. And you have, after some relaxation of this thinking, but it was only a relaxation of this thinking, you have a revival of this idea, nationalism and individualism. The problem with it is, leaving some very fundamental problems aside, that we have this now in a world where we find everything being dri uh, driven in, into uh, a non-individualist, non-nationalist orientation. Even if we are behaving, uh, some people say there's this hyper-individualism, I can't stand it. Everybody is there with a the phone and whatever, they don't talk to each other. This is socialization. We should not forget that these instruments are instruments of socialization. We had been talking to our neighbor because we didn't have choice. Now we can talk to everybody literally in the world, kind of. Now we have Facebook. Not everybody, I don't have it anymore. But it is an instrument of socialization. It is a social media. Whatever they, they Mr. Zuckerberg and others, do with it. But it is something there, and it is something that overcomes, to some extent, national orientation. It is interesting, actually, where you see this um, in its opposite, that Facebook, I don't know the details now, uh, and, and uh, WeChat and uh, WhatsApp uh, is, is similar. Uh, WhatsApp and, and uh, Kakao you have. These are regional. Um, Facebook, I heard, it's the north, northern hemisphere, and there is uh, another one for the southern hemisphere. I, I forgot the name. It was kind of common here as well. Uh, but there is a divide. But it is still not national anymore, but it is the area, its regions. WeChat is Chinese, uh, especially. I don't know if in other countries as well. Kakao is uh, Korea and, and Japan. Um, what's up is Europe, and I, I assume it's, it's the United States as well. So you have this uh, development of overcoming nationalism. Aside and going hand in hand with something of, uh, yes, I am whatever, I am German, Chinese, French. Now, the other two points is, in terms of methodolo methodology, we have something I called uh, religiosization. Uh, I like inventing new terms. Uh, it is something we take as a religion. The state is religion. And the state is Mr. Trump. And Mr. Trump is God. Not going so far, but near enough. Uh, we have this entire... It's, it's a strange thing, actually. The, the entire populism is not about the people, but it is about individuals at the top. It's Mr. Trump, it's Mr. Johnson, it's my uh, May. Uh, it's, it's these people. It's Mother Merkel. Um, we, we personalize these uh, 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 relevant people. It is for the supposedly populism, but it is something that is uh, concentrated, that is focused on individuals, and they can say what they want to say, because this is something new. Uh, we do not have the old divides anymore as a matter of uh, parties and strict orientations in certain groups. This is blurring in many cases, uh, where we have, a, a, again, a difficulty of identifying ourselves. Now, the other thing is still we are stuck in the concept of states. It is difficult for us to think international relations, and it is nearly impossible for us to think global 
relations. Because we need an actor. We need somebody, some institution that is definitely uh, responsible. And this is uh, where I'm kind of stuck how to overcome actually this tension of our thinking being uh, guided by the old traditional uh, ideas and our action going beyond this. We have and we should have the concept of citizenship, but we should not forget that citizenship is something that is limiting and that it is that is excluding. Citizenship is a form of legalized discrimination. If you are not Chinese, this is defining you. Then you are somebody else. The other way around, if you are Chinese, you are citizen of China, you are citizen of Ireland, then you are one of us. Permanently constructing uh, the other. The other our identity is depending on the other, otherwise it's not relevant. We don't talk about it. And other, the, the other identity is relevant now, and there I have problems, well, not problems, but I have a question as well, how far is it really justified to talk about uh, nationalism in terms of the economic changes that, go, that are going on? We have with these industries uh, actually, of course, a national conflict between different, the, the trade wars are, are the typical example for it, but we have something else. We have a new economic system, we have a new accumulation regime, we have new productive forces, and this is the real clash. Where do they go? And how will they develop? Now, a very bleak picture was fascism in Germany, which was supported by one group, heavy industries, and uh, not supported by the others, the soft industries, the light industries, uh, like uh, chemicals and so on. So it was more or less clear the different groups. What is going on now on a global level? Who supports really digital development in, uh, in an advanced way, in a democratic way? And who is going to use it just for making profit in terms of one and zero? I can go a little bit into physics then. Who is following the old mechanical way of I am the strongest, I am the strongest state in this case, and who is going for quantum theory and saying we, we have flexibility there. We do not have to follow this one way uh, in a linear process, but we can shape it. I hear very different things from uh, the New Silk Road. I don't know actually if, if there are reliable, really reliable uh, figures on it and, and who spends what and who gets what, what out of it. Um, would be interesting really to, to question then the data we have. But at least conceptually, I think it is an issue where China tries apparently to go a new way. I'm, I'm very he hesitating, as you see, tries at least to go a new way and say, OK, we have our interest. Of course we have. We have to look after I don't know how many million and a billion people. But at the same time, you know, I switch to African from uh, in a conceptual way, uh, the Ubuntu. I am only because you are. I am only, China is only because we have to go uh, with the others. We have to link in a productive way with the other states. And we see all these problems uh, of environmental issues, uh, of migration uh, in, uh, within the countries and uh, across border. Uh, we have other demog demographic uh, problems uh, and we have a very simple problem we have to feed, I don't know, I should have uh, looked up the number, uh, quite a lot of people on this world. And there is no way, and I say this for a special reason, because we are, some people say, near to it, there is no way to solve this problem by war. 
and Mr. Trump is going this way, sorry, I have to say this is my conviction that he is really risking this, others as well, but as well, there are many people, well, not many, but there are some people, some colleagues who say, what is the solution? We have to control population. And as we cannot control it in terms of uh, an absolute birth stop, or I don't know what, every second uh, family may have one child or whatsoever, just is the question, at least they ask you this question, is war the solution? I think it is not, and I think there it is really necessary to overcome not the concept of citizenship, but the, to overcome uh, the, the national dimension of, citizen, uh, of, of citizenship, in which way something, I guess, we can uh, learn from the different contributions. Thank you.